Hi, I'm Alan Hess. I'm the author of this new book, The Palm Springs School, 1934 to 1975, which will be published in February of 2025. And today we have a group of very distinguished experts in their individual fields. Each of them contributed an essay to the book on a specific topic, which relates to Palm Springs and why it is not just a glamorous spa with wonderful architecture, beautiful houses, but really contributed to the ideas of modern architecture in the 20th century and today. And so we're going to have a discussion today about those sub some of those subjects, drawing on the expertises of each of our experts who, as I say, do have essays on particular subjects in the book. I wrote the main text, but there's so many angles still to be discussed, still to be dug up about Palm Springs. I'd like to just go around the, the group, and if you'll just introduce yourselves, specifically what the subject is of your essay. George, would you go first? Yeah, I'm George Thomas. I'm an architectural and cultural historian who has, I guess from my father's Navy career, lived near the ocean all my life. And that meant that I've been looking at resorts and places, the special places that people resort to, so to speak. My core focus in my writing has been about a group of architects working out of Philadelphia who transformed American architecture toward modern architecture because of an industrial clientele. And their special role, Frank Furness, of course, teaches Louis Sullivan, who teaches Frank Louis Wright, but he also teaches Price, and then he teaches George Howe, who has Lou Kahn and Robert Venturi. So in many ways, the, there's a whole strain of modern architecture that passes through Philly. Thank you. Next, Christine. Hi, thanks, Alan. My name is Christine Madrid French, and I'm an architectural historian and the executive director at Napa County Landmarks. And for this book, I wrote about the Sarasota School in Florida and how that coordinates with the development of the Palm Springs School of Architecture in Palm Springs in California. And I wanted to compare and contrast the development of those two different but similar styles in modernism. Thanks. Ken. Next. Thanks. Uh, I'm Ken Lyon. I am a licensed architect, been in Palm Springs since about 2005, and worked for the city of Palm Springs in the planning department since 2006. In that role, I was associate planner, then principal planner, and I was the city's first historic preservation officer. So historic preservation is kind of the linkage that I'm hoping to share with you on the book. The time that I've been in Palm Springs, I think has really, for me anyways, been that which is the, I've watched it kind of grow from this disdain to that which is a primary driver of our economic model in the city. So it's been an amazing time to be here. Thank you. Uh, Sion, next, please. Oh, hi, I'm Sion Winship. I am president of the Society of Architectural Historians, Southern California chapter, and an independent preservation consultant. The topic of my essay, From Reservation to Real Estate Empire, focused on the Agua Caliente tribe and their contributions to modernism here. Great. And Eddie? Yeah, my name is Eddie Jones. I'm the founding principal of Jones Studio. We're based in the Phoenix area, specifically Tempe, not far from the School of Architecture at the University of Arizona State University. And I grew up in Oklahoma and I went to school at Oklahoma State University, but I have a very close relationship with uh, the School of Architecture at OU, which, as you all probably know, Bruce Goff put that school on the map. You know, Alan asked me to write about the American school, but you can't write about the American school without, you know, looking backwards and forwards and how the American school influenced the Arizona school and how the case study program influenced the Palm Springs school and how these four so-called schools are related. It was a lot of fun, you know, to explore those relationships and connect the dots. If you're getting the idea, there is more to be discussed about uh, Palm Springs, the role of the Agua Caliente tribe, region-wide architecture of the 20th century. 
and what its import was. Different schools of architecture like Sarasota and others. And then the specific role of a resort as well. Again, seems like a frivolous subject, but actually resorts have had a big impact on modern architecture, certainly through the 20th century, even before uh, George's essay explains. So to start off, I wanted to quote from one of the Palm Springs architects, Albert Frey, in a letter that he wrote in 1935 to his former employer, Le Corbusier, in Paris. And Frey, who was at that time had visited, had connections with Palm Springs, And he wrote to Corbusier to explain to this European what the American desert was all about. And he says, New York is not America. The East Coast is still quite European, enlarged to grotesque proportion. It is the new towns out West, established during the evolution of the automobile, where modern American life is found. This is what attracted this Swiss-born architect, Albert Frey, to eventually settle in Palm Springs. Can any of you explain what it might be about those towns out west where American life is found and why that should be important to developing a new idea about modern architecture? can't agree more with Albert Frey's quote, very insightful for that many decades ago. I know for me, you know, having been to the East Coast many times, I think there's still outside influence projects itself, you know, on architecture and planning still today. You know, in the in the Wild West, it's 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 less burdened. There's a completely different context and not to mention the climate. I have the good fortune of working all over the United States, up in the cold country, as well as down in the Sonoran Desert. And I got to tell you, it is a lot easier to practice architecture in the Sonoran Desert. It's the difference between having to put your building in a big, thick, heavy hooded parka versus wearing flip-flops and cutoffs. You know, it's so much easier, you know, to create thinness and an elegance that is difficult to achieve, you know, in other places in the United States. Thinness and an elegance. So is would, would that be something that distinguishes the modern architecture of, of the West and Palm Springs? Pretty good description, Alan. Buildings weigh a lot less out here in the West than they do on the East Coast and up North, literally. <laughs> And, and, you know, post-World War II, the case study architects, you know, they, they, they had the, the resources, the surplus steel to create these, you know, very thin roof plates and, and long spans. And, and as a result, transparency, which, which is kind of the, the ratio of mass to void is flipped from the more ancient architecture, which had much less void and more mass. Not, not that that that's uh, anything wrong. I mean, I I love mixing the weight of history with the possibilities of modernism. Great. Any anybody else have an idea about what is distinctive about the West, Palm Springs in particular, in terms of architecture? And what kind of- well, let me just jump in looking sort of spatially at the way these places develop. I think what's what's so important is that the the West is truly a distant web. It's a web in which each community, in a sense, is not part of the next. And that means that you develop a sort of within regions specific character, specific materiality. You know, before trains, you build out of what was at hand. And so architecture in the certainly in the, in the early 19th century, is very much place-bound. But the other big piece that I think is crucial is, is looking at the places that make these places attractive as resort. And that's where, of course, Palm Springs is so unique. Most resorts are water places. They're places where you can cool off from an ocean or you can take a dip in a lake. My experience in Palm Springs was that it was relatively hot and dry when I went through it in the summer but it has the miracle of low humidity 
and comfort in the winter. And so there's a there's a special quality also of the seasonality of some of these places. And Palm Springs is one of those. I think that you're right. And I think the thing that also brings a characteristic set of ingredients that was particularly unique in the mid-century, the mid-20th century for Palm Springs was, as you mentioned, the material availability post-World War II. But it was also this extraordinarily convenient time, perhaps, when energy was cheap. And if you were really building for this climate, as they did in ancient times, you wouldn't build thin and you wouldn't build glass. But there was this wonderful opportunity when energy was cheap and you could just pump these glassy, thin-walled boxes full of cool air and everything was perfect. The other thing that I think is interesting, as you mentioned it as a vacation town, is during the mid-20th century, this really still was very much a seasonal place. And they jokingly say, you know, you could throw a bowling ball down Palm Canyon Drive in Palm Springs in the summertime and not hit anything or anyone because everybody had pretty much left because of the heat. So those characteristics coming together, I think, really helped make this architecture grow into something that was uh, different from what you're seeing in modern architecture elsewhere. What your description of how people were inspired to come west to experiment with architecture reminds me of that quote from Frank Lloyd Wright, where he says, tip the world over on its side and everything blues will land in Los Angeles. And I think when you think about that and also the way Richard Neutra was inspired, you know, I read about in his own words when he was in Austria and he's walking around and he's not sure of his future and he sees this billboard for California with palm trees. And he said that moment he decided he had to get out there. He'd heard about it. He'd studied it. And something I think people were inspired because there was an innovative artistic freedom for them when they were seeking out new ways to create buildings. One of the things that I learned in the course of my research that hadn't really thought about out here was that the availability of the land of the Agua Caliente, when it all came together and finally after many, many decades of broken promises by the U.S. government and the tribe was actually able to start leasing them, it inspired a whole different kind of building here, particularly one that spoke to the resort aspect that we've been talking about today. So in, instead of having to do you know, infill development or infill buildings or hotels or whatever it might be to support the resort economy, suddenly you had these vast expanses of land from the checkerboard where you could build golf resorts. So it was perfectly timed for the rise of golf you know, uh, nationwide and condominiums were developed, which were all meant to be, you know, sort of leisure second homes or, or vacation homes. And so you have a real concentration of that kind of development and, a, and also a concentration of modernism and modern architecture here in the South End because of what the tribe had to offer. And if I may, I think there was also, you called on it or, or mentioned it a little bit, Theon, this availability of open land you know, I spent 17 years in Chicago before my 20 years in Palm Springs, and I see so many parallels between what caused the Chicago school to emerge and what's caused the Palm Springs school to emerge. And it was this this available land and this moment in time where there's this need for all this kind of, and almost a demand for structures and for places and you've got this group of architects who are more than willing and ready, almost chomping at the bit to practice what they just, you know, were being taught at school. I think the parallels, when, when this whole discussion of the Palm Springs School came up, I, I really, it resonates for me, having spent so much time in both places. It's that vastness of space and that moment in time where there's this wonderful convergence of talent and need. I do think that where you stand in a city does affect the way you think about architecture and the history of architecture. You're standing in the middle of the Ile de Cité in Paris. Then you're going to have one perspective on what architecture, modern architecture, is about. But if you're standing at the corner of Tockets Canyon and Palm Canyon Drive, looking around at the landscape, the open space, and you're so far from New York that you don't have the kind of pressures to conform to certain expectations about what architecture, what modern architecture would be about. 
then you could do, you know, new possibilities open up. And that I really think is what these talented architects who for so many different reasons ended up in Palm Springs. Frey was from Switzerland, Neutra from Austria, Don Wexler from Minnesota, Stu Williams from Ohio, et cetera. Bill Cody was originally from Ohio also. There's something that drew them to Palm Springs and then to stay in Palm Springs. They had the sense of freedom and the open space and the new possibilities and the technology, whether it's of the automobile or of air conditioning, that opened up these new possibilities. And created was- patrons too. I mean, the patrons were were the ones, right? The patrons said, "We'll we'll try anything." You know, we want to see what you can you can make. And then maybe also the absence of uh, building codes, <laughs> at least out in Florida, there weren't very many building codes, and uh, you could basically build whatever you wanted. I think for a young architect, also being in these places, I mean, I think Don Wexler was probably in his late thirties or thereabouts when he did the Palm Springs International Airport Terminal. How many chances do you get in current times as an architect in your 30s to do an entire airport terminal without being bothered by everyone else who's got talent, right? I think they they saw this wonderful moment where there were these really great commissions also that were available for the taking. City Hall, the airport, schools, These are things that, you know, usually architecture we think of as being an old man's profession, right? These guys were fresh out of school getting these great opportunities for these big commissions. And the great thing was that they didn't put together a commission, figure out some New York architect that they ought to invite. Uh, they They were really willing to take chances. So remarkable, but that's partly because so much of the architecture is personal and individual. And that creates the chance for young architects to to often do things, which then leads to those civic commissions. When I think of major resorts on the East Coast, they were typically mature architects doing mature buildings. And out out on the West, and this is also, I think, Alan's stomping grounds in terms of young architects who could create whole chain identities. And I I think of all of the Googie architects half of whom clearly went through Palm Springs and and brought their openness and their freedom and their delight in the automobile. Well, the the period photographs of the tail finned cars, you know, take you back to the ideas when these machines were things you waited for with bated breath. And late at the end of the year, they would start to show up on trucks being driven into town and they would be shrouded so you couldn't see them until they were unveiled. You know, there was that world of magic when design was something that everybody was looking forward to. George, in your essay, you talk about resorts in the history of American culture and society. Now, resorts are usually considered frivolous, whimsical, for enjoyment, for pleasure, and, and yet are not really considered perhaps to be serious architecture. Do you agree with that? Or do you think there's something serious about pleasure and recreation that we should consider? I think the biggest thing is that that they really became places where the super wealthy individuals could create their own identity so that people knew them by their houses, by their mansions in, in Newport, for example or by their extraordinary camps in the Adirondacks that, again, were identified with people. Or the counter was the mass resort with the mass building uh, that represented the aspirations of the many. And so, you know, the the big mass resorts like Cape May with huge hotels became something that defined both the character but also the opportunity of of industrial America. And that's, I think, a, a huge piece that we have to go back to at some point and begin to grapple with, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how this election plays out because you start to see the conflict between those with great wealth trying to control an economy versus those aspirational to participate in that society. And resource for places that you could do it. Wildwood was was low-end, high-identity, fun architecture, not, not far off of Palm Springs. Newport was great until the servants cost a lot. And you can see 
uh, that resorts are, are really part of the life that we've created in this country. And I think that's a huge piece of why they're important. But my question would be why Palm Springs? You know, back in the old days, I used to drive from Phoenix to Los Angeles a lot, and I would I always pulled over to Palm Springs. But along the way, you know, I would see these failed attempts at resorts, Desert Center, you know, with the dead palm tree rings and the the old school that looked like Richard Neutra designed it. And then you get further in and there's desert hot springs across the road. And why why did, did not, that not thrive when as Palm Springs thrived? Was it leadership, corruption? What happened? I, I have a theory, kind of a working mm-hmm. theory about that, which is, you know, the history of Palm Springs and the glamour associated with it is directly tied to the movie industry. So in addition to having Palm Canyon and other natural elements, the springs, of course, themselves, this was this was known as the place where you could always get back within two hours to be back at the studio if, if, if production went, went back on, onto your film. So, so it was about as far away as you could get, couldn't get all the way to Desert Center. And, and having that element of the movie industry out here also gave the place a sense of you know, incredible elegance and and excitement that is unlike some of the other places in the desert. I think there was also a very savvy group of locals here at the time with, uh, of course, names at the moment are going to escape me, but they were doing a marvelous job of self-promotion to those places back east and in L.A. and Chicago where people hadn't quite heard yet about Palm Springs, but suddenly they started seeing this, as you mentioned, Sid, the glamorous sights come. So I think it was a group of, of very sharp local landowners and promoters who who really understood keenly the market that they had around them, particularly with Hollywood bringing its glamour to, to the desert that really helped pull it all together. Yeah. And two of those clients, patrons at that time that we talk about in the book are Pearl McCallum and Nellie Kaufman. Exactly. Uh, what, what, could somebody talk about, you know, what was their influence uh, on that in creating that sort of environment for the resort and the new architecture? Well, I think with Pearl, you know, Pearl McManus was the daughter of Judge John McCollum, who was one of the first non-native settlers that ventured into the uh, Palm Springs area and became a major landowner. And it was only after, you know, the failure and the drought and everything that happened in the early 1900s that I think she began to say, how do I pick up the pieces here of what I've inherited and make something of it? And she was shrewd. She owned most of the downtown area in Palm Springs. And she was she was involved with what the people that were going to buy the land from her were going to build. And even and when you look at the Oasis Hotel, you know, Lloyd Wright, Alan speaks about it a lot in the book, and it's it's one of those major pieces of kind of unknown modern architecture, right? That's right there in our downtown. She was involved pulling that stuff together. And even after it's sold, you know, it was built in mid twenties. She sells the property. Then in the mid fifties, Western hotels decide they're going to demolish half of it. And she's no, 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 not quite yet. I'm going to take my homestead and I'm going to take some of these other things and drag them down the street here to some land that I have, because I think it's pretty important still. And then we get East Stuart Williams building the Oasis commercial building. It by itself is another landmark. So, you know, is this a matter of fate? Is this a matter of careful choosing that Pearl had at the time of who's going to take this land and do something with it? Who knows? But I think that that kind of evolution of stuff it plays itself over and over again in Palm Springs, which is really fascinating for such a small place. Well, Chris, Sarasota, Florida also had entertainment roots also. Was that different than Palm Springs, or do you have any perspective on that? Uh, yeah, the entertainment roots in Sarasota, Florida, were started with the Ringlings, as, and they built a gigantic mansion called Ka Design. And their most prominent modernists started with Ka Design, which is a very elaborate you know, overdone kind of mix up Mediterranean Gothic. But it's the same year as the Oasis Hotel, which I found interesting that these two buildings were made at the same time. 
And, but it took Sarasota a little bit longer to come around to modernism. But the Ringlings still have a huge presence in Sarasota. There's a big museum. And, a, and so entertainment really started also that, that community. <clears throat> Eddie, we're talking about this broader story of the American school throughout the basically the great Southwest. But there were certain interactions. It, it wasn't that Palm Springs was its own little creative hub that just developed stuff. There's interaction with the other cities throughout the Southwest, weren't there? Academically, professionally, I suppose so too. You know, I could I could only speak for myself, but I, you know, the influences mm-hmm. of you know being surrounded by golf buildings and Frank Lloyd Wright buildings in Oklahoma. And and being in you know college during the '60s, th- those were you know very formative years. And and I you know again, I I grew up in Oklahoma. I had never been anywhere. Anything I knew came from books or special teachers. And so I decided to move to Arizona. Why? Well, because I was young and naive. And I thought if it was good enough for Paolo Soleri and Frank Lloyd Wright, it's good enough for me. And those beautiful silhouetted saguaros against the sunset helped too. So, you know, maybe maybe the accumulation of like-minded individuals comes from, you know, different sources. But, but I, I brought that influence with me. Turns out... There are a lot of other guys, you know, that are around my age that have the same kind of influences. And you know what? They were drawn to the area for the same reasons I was. And and so I suppose it's not unusual that the this so-called Arizona school would, would be coined by Reed Kroloff and 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 that it would have its roots in a, in the American school. It's 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 just a straight line, Alan. And then, but but again, all of us were very cognizant of the case study program. It very inf- continues to be influential, and you know, so we draw influences from that too. So if if you're asking. You know, in this broader term, well, of course, of course, these these schools of thought begin to radiate, you know, beyond the borders. And 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 if one is lucky enough, you actually get to be let the, the magnetism pull you in and you actually end up in the physical place. But, you know, Alan, I, I think the days of schools of thought being a result of architectural liberation or social movements may be behind us, you know, given, you know, climate change and and the forces of nature. And nature has always been at the my main resource of influence, uh, regardless of what architectural schools you want to talk about. But, you know, with Jones Studio, we're starting to talk about a different kind of school of thought that's based on watersheds. You know, we should be called the Colorado Plateau School, <laughs> you know, because the the scarcity of water and the, and the future of water is it be, has become not becoming but has become a very important driving force behind how we do our buildings now and and, and maybe history will look back on these times you know the cusp of climate change as being a very important you know form giver to a new kind of responsible architecture not that, that you know I love the conversation about the invention of the air conditioner and how, again, it liberated the architecture in Palm Springs. When I was in Cody's house a few years ago, I marveled at how thin that roof was. And I mean, they're what, 
two inches of insulation and a 120 degree heat beating on it and floor to ceiling glass all the way around it. Beautiful, beautiful place to be. But if you tried to do that now, it would be completely irresponsible. And, and I struggle with this. Even I'm sitting in my conference room now and, you know, it's, it's glass, but it, the orientation is, is appropriate. But when I get to the corners, I still can't bring myself to butt two pieces of insulated glass together in a corner. I have to transition to mono glass and screw it. I, I mean, I'm going to do it. But I'm sort of rambling now. But I, I think, it, you know, it's we can't stop talking about schools of thought in the old context without beginning to have conversations about a new force field, you know, that's going to affect architecture. I think it could be true. I have a feeling, though, when I think about the uniqueness of the Palm Springs School, you know, I spent 17 years, as I mentioned, in Chicago before coming out to Palm Springs. And Chicago is all about business and corporate architecture and it's Miesian and it's these serious buildings and they're black boxes and we got lots of them. And the first ones were innovative and interesting, but it's all still really corporate. It's business. It's cold. Mm -hmm. It's dark. It's cloudy Chicago, right? Mm -hmm. I move out to Palm Springs and here's all these pastel colors. And it's like almost like having houses with tail fins, right? These mm -hmm. butterfly roofs and all of this kind of whimsy, right? So, like, like the land vibration. It's modernism that's like not taking itself quite so seriously, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. somebody coined the phrase a while ago, martini modernism. And some people feel it's disparaging, but I think it's perfect because Palm Springs, the architecture in Palm Springs and even the architects at the time, I don't think they were taking themselves quite as seriously as, you know, Mies was doing back in Chicago at the very same time, right? these were clients coming out here and owners who were coming out here and architects who were coming out here going, this is a place to kind of relax and chill and be on vacation. And the, the mental paradigm, I think, of the two places helps, I think, create why the Chicago architecture from the mid-20th century looks so dramatically different from the Palm Springs architecture from the mid-20th century. And... I found myself while I was in Chicago being attracted to other things. I found the mid-century architecture of Mies van der Rohe to be kind of dull and boring. And I went to school at the University of Michigan where most of my professors had actually worked with Mies at the time. And they were these, you know, Mies disciples that were still teaching and stuff. And I was, I was really refreshed as an architect when I first got to Palm Springs and I thought, there's a whole different language of modern architecture that's that's been created here at that time that I just want to know more about. And that was what kind of, that's what I see uh, as what kind of really distinguishes Palm Springs is it didn't have to take itself so seriously and solve the same problems that Mies was trying to solve back in Chicago. You think if you said that to any of the case study architects, that they weren't taking it seriously, that they would agree with you? <laughs> I well, don't I, so. I don't know. I'm sure they took themselves very seriously. <laughs> but I think, I guess what I mean by taking oneself seriously, they were certainly uh, intentional. But mm -hmm. I think the program, if you want to come back to like, what's the program here? You know, for Palm Springs, it was about play, uh, Chicago mm -hmm. and elsewhere. I would say you know, it was much more this, the, the program was to solve business problems and housing problems, right? Those case study houses, yes, they were certainly, I think, uh, pivotal, but I'm not sure how much they actually influenced the Palm Springs School or whether the Palm Springs School was kind of spinning and evolving by itself nearby. And that's a question I'd like to put to George. George, was modern architecture imported into Palm Springs, or did modern architecture evolve indigenously in any way, do you think? Well, one of the people that I encountered in my last, I hope last book on Frank Furness was Thorsten Veblen and his theory of the business class as opposed to theory of the leisure class. 
And the juxtaposition between the two books, I think, is really interesting. Because in a sense, Newport was leisure class. But Chicago, and in many ways, Palm Springs, was business class. And the key that Bevelin brought out in business class was that they had a different ahistorical progressive point of view because their worlds were about those point of views. That they didn't get any benefit from looking backward to how history would deal with some industrial problem. The industrial world was how did you solve the problem? And I think in, in a critical way, Palm Springs architects had the fun of working for a clientele who were not old farts. And I was just looking at Bing Crosby's unfortunate plantation house in, in Los Angeles with the big columns that I sort of thought reminded me of, you know, some of those uh, mid-century modern banks in Palm Springs. But the, the point of, of Bing was that he was saying, I'm with these people. This is who I want to be. A lot of the other artists, a lot of, you know, uh, screen actors didn't see, they saw themselves as part of a production team and they were able to see worlds in which things were being made and done. And that meant a different type of client, a different type of building. And that was the miracle of Palm Springs was that it was close enough for Hollywood, young enough for young architects to do their thing and uh, able to create a new type of culture that didn't look back. And I think that was the you know, the, the great point of it and it's, it's just as an aside for Ken and my, my the last 12 years I spent teaching at Harvard in a program that was looking at the ills and problems of historic preservation and having seen what happened to Cape May when it took on being the greatest Victorian resort in the world, now is producing some of the dullest, worst fake Victorian architecture ever seen. And so the biggest question for Palm Springs, I think, is how do you keep it looking forward in a way that means that it will continue to be of interest as opposed to a museum of dead ideas of old white-haired people. Well, I wanted to ask with this theme of looking forward, are there lessons from this history of Palm Springs in the mid 20th century that we can learn today? We touched on a couple of them. I'm you know, particularly interested and really glad that in this book we have some really fresh new information. For example, like Sion's work on the Agua Caliente tribe and their influence, what their role was, and that uh, it was Viola Ortner, the uh, head of the, uh, the, the tribe, the tribal council, who really got things moving, not only for the tribe, but for Palm Springs in, in that period. But I would like to throw that question out there. What other lessons do you see for today that we can draw from what happened in Palm Springs? Well, Alan, just to build on what you were saying about Viola Ortner, I, I think that one of the things that we talk about in, in the book and in the essay is, is the power that diversity brings to the table. It's truly remarkable to think that it was a tribal council made up entirely of women that helped pull the tribe out of the oppression of the U.S. government for nearly a hundred years, a sort of systematic disenfranchisement of, of the Agua Caliente. But sort of the unexpected takeaway for me after all of that was that, uh, and we won't get into the, to the weeds, but when we finally got to the point where the government allowed uh, the Agua Caliente to have 60, 70, 100 year leases on the, on the area in the, in the South End and throughout the, the tribal checkerboard that they had, the only people that were willing to invest in that were developers from the Midwest. So here's a, again, another comparison to the experience of modernism in, in the Midwest. And they had the, the resources and the marketing connections to build resorts in the South End. They were almost also to a person of the Jewish faith. And up until that time, almost all of Palm Springs was closed to people of the Jewish faith. They were either not shown real estate in areas where it was not friendly. There might have been restrictive covenants, etc. And I can think of at least one hotel owner who whose name we won't mention, used to kick people out of her hotel and not take their, not, you know, welcome them back 
if they were Jewish. And so as a result, the entire south end of Palm Springs became sort of a Jewish enclave and a rich Jewish community in its own right at the hands of a dozen women of you know, tribal ancestry who in their own way were, were making this a much more diverse place. Alan, I'd like to add something too. So you're talking about the lessons that we can learn from Palm Springs at mid-century and maybe how they embraced the new architecture. I'd be interested in looking more at this transition from the solid, you know, the glass with very thin roof structures that we've been talking about to the monumental concrete of John Lautner and some of the uh, structures that were made at that point. How could you, you know, the the ability for the patrons and the and the community to embrace those buildings eventually? I know they're probably considered pretty outrageous when they were built, but then those became sort of that new and the, the next in the future. And I think what we're facing now, when somebody builds something that's completely different, people tend to to not want to see that. They like you like you were saying about Cape May. It doesn't match, you know. It doesn't match how it should look like in Palm Springs now. Mm-hmm. But what you want to do is encourage different types of architecture. So one of my principles as a historian is I am not an architectural critic, so I won't ever say that a building is ugly. Right, because every kind of building is representative of the community that it's being constructed in and the time period that it represents. And I think that kind of attitude must have been part of what propelled Palm Springs into the monumental concrete phase that you cover in the book in the 19, late 60s, early 70s. You can make the case that contextual is an evil word. In what way? Because it pushes design toward limits of what's already there rather than, again, encouraging architects to figure out what they can do that is the future. And so that becomes, when, when you see everything... I think a lot of the discussion of what you're saying on... One's frozen. I, I, Ken, I think you were frozen there for a moment. Yeah, I apologize. I, I My screen had frozen. My, only, my thought was about materials. You know, Frank Lloyd Wright... I'm sorry, Lloyd Wright Jr. was doing concrete in 1925. The city's very first building that it built was a library, concrete, poured in place concrete. So the interesting notion of materials, with with all the technological advances that came out of World War II, of course, we saw all this thinness and all that kind of evolution of materiality and architecture. But, you know, before World War II, the modern architects in Palm Springs were doing stuff with the materials that were durable in this scorchingly hot heat. And they were also the materials that would resist this this environment. You know, you you will. Everybody knows when you build with concrete, there's a lag time before that heat finally makes it through all that concrete and starts to warm up the inside. I think there was an understanding of that because we know today, as we look back at the stuff from the mid 20th century and earlier, the wood in Palm Springs just gets annihilated with the heat and the and the dryness, whereas they were already working with reinforced poured in place concrete as early as the 20s and earlier in Palm Springs. And I think the architecture had its expression and was responding to the materials that were coming out at the time. Wexler will tell you when you talk, listen to Chrysler, they were working with materials that were new and they wanted to play with this stuff and figure out how to do it differently. And, and I think that's part of what we also saw, too, in the post-World War II period in Palm Springs. The whole world today is dealing with extreme conditions, especially climatological conditions of working architect today. How do you see the this effect of extreme conditions in the climate? Are there any lessons for that we should be thinking about in terms of what Palm Springs or the West developed? What should we be thinking about for tomorrow? Alan, that's an excellent question. And and I have my answer is so ironic. The lessons were provided to us by the Native Americans. And and, and if you look at the way they survived in the intense heat and the the water shortages, that it's still relevant. It's still, these are still valid passive principles that the benefit of, of knowing about the passive principle and, and the combination of that with, you know, advanced technologies. And 
I think we often, and I'd love to hear CM's response to this too, given her historic research. I, I'm thrilled that these these lessons of the past are are still influential and, and relevant to the future. You know, I live in a dirt house. I live in a, a rammed earth house. I mean, that's a three thousand year old idea that I stole. But but my house is a lot cooler than my neighbors' houses are, and I harvest rainwater. I mean, people think that if if you're in a place with infrequent rain, then why bother trying to capture it? Well, that's the reason you want to capture it, because it doesn't rain very often. And I, I'm encouraged. I see, you know, we all know about lead and this and that, but I'm, I'm seeing a, a, a much more emotional, resourceful response to climate change now within, you know, my colleagues. So you talk about lessons, Alan. We've known nature will always provide the lesson. She will always lead in the correct direction with integrity. Well, and isn't nature one of the core principles of the American school going back, you know, yeah. yes. well more than 150 years, right? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. And Frank Lloyd Wright all started with nature and mm -hmm. developed modern mm -hmm. architecture so it's there if we look and and you can you know work with nature she always wins or you can work against her either way nature is informing the architecture there was a, a thought that you'd mentioned earlier that that's triggering a, a little bit of different thread for me which was around the earlier discussion about is there a valid way that you look at this architecture that has been identified as something unique to Palm Springs that was happening 50, now 60, 70 years ago. How do we translate this stuff going forward so we don't become a caricature of ourself as we celebrate the architecture in Palm Springs from the mid 20th century? The question within my essay was, do these things only happen? Does the person Prairie School happened. Does the Sarasota, excuse me, Sarasota School, the Palm Springs School, are these things moments in time mm -hmm. that we can celebrate culturally and in terms of maybe a little thread of advancement of a civilization? Are we are we fooling ourselves to think that somehow this beauty and this love that we have for this stuff that happened here sixty years ago or so can be perpetuated? And I watch at the city in my role as a uh, principal city planner, as well as working on the preservation stuff. This question comes up all the time. We need better design standards. We're getting things that are not good. It's not as strong. And the architectural expression is what we were getting back in the 50s. And I'm wondering, because I've we've been struggling with this, is this something that just happened at that time? And are, are we fooling, like you were mentioning with the Victorian architecture becoming like a cliche of itself, are we fooling ourselves into thinking we can continue to see this thing, which is the Palm Springs School of Architecture, perpetuating? Or are we, are we observing a moment in history like we did with the Prairie School? You know, I'm sitting in Chicago this week, and I'm not seeing prairie style buildings being built, of course, right? The city's doing great new architecture, but, and we need to be doing new good architecture, excellent architecture in Palm Springs too. How do you encourage that? Are we trying too hard perhaps to think that we can perpetuate what we had happen here in the fifties architecturally with what's happening now as we move into the next several decades? One thought that occurred to me just one of those erratic things that flits across is suppose you made a regulation that you couldn't hire any architect over 40. Uh, <laughs> and in a sense, you began to, to look. I resent that. <laughs> uh, I know that. I get that as well. But you begin looking for architects who were still finding their way rather than those who were already there, which I think becomes a big problem that uh, all these places that are bounded and, you know, one of the dangers of of calling this the Palm Springs School is that it then begins to say, this is what Palm Springs is. And the real question that we have to keep getting at is, 
what can Palm Springs be? And it can be, I think, you know, from Eddie, that Eddie could say it's it's a way to look at the environment. It's a it's a case study in solving the horrific environmental issues. Because the key thing about Palm Springs was people left in, in early spring. They, they Before it got hot, they got out of there. I, I'm in a camp in Maine that, as you can see, has walls you know, that are an inch of, of pine with some shingle on the outside. And we get out of here in late October because it just gets too miserable. You, you're now trying to solve a problem in Palm Springs, which is how do you make the, the classic what every resort wants, a 365-day resort. The environment is tough for that. We notice that the rooms are cheaper to rent in July than they are in February. I think, too, that we can't forget that there have been moments where the buildings of Palm Springs or modernism in general in, and other building styles, including Art Deco and Victorian, have gone through periods where they were uh, you know, held in disdain and mm -hmm. people were very intent on demolishing it. So the architecture of Palm Springs has not always been widely appreciated. I think it's been a very specific audience. And we all remember when Modernism Week got started, that part of that was to stem the tide of the demolition. And even in Los Angeles, even today, you'll still see really important structures uh, targeted for demolition. People still don't understand some of these structures. And same with Victorian, that whole period when they were being demolished in the 1970s. And now everyone's like, oh, we love our Victorians. And I'm like, do you? Do you really love those Victorians? Because there are still, you know, people who don't understand it. So I think architecture is very cyclical and that really to be prepared, Palm Springs needs to be prepared, not just right now where everybody just loves all the modernism there, but be prepared for 50 or 60 years from now when there could be yet another one of these drops in the popularity of that kind of architecture as the structures that are being restored right now have to go through another restoration and then another restoration. And so I think thinking about the longevity of the collection of Palm Springs buildings is important. Well, I think there's also a concern and I think it ties to what you just said. What are we going to be celebrating here in 60 years? What are we going to be celebrating in 60 years in Palm Springs that still has the strength and the draw, what I'll call intellectual uh, rigor of understanding it and being impressed by it? I, I, working for the city, I feel a little frustrated with some of the stuff that comes through right now because I don't see it having that same kind of uh, lasting effect nor the same kind of originality originality. And I think as we try to create design standards, we run the risk of causing the architecture to be like a caricature of what we like. Okay, well, we're going to wrap up here, but I wanted to just go around to each of you once again with this question that I wanted this book to present Palm Springs in a new perspective, present new ideas about it, present new buildings and architects as well. So I'd like to ask each of you, is there a particular building or architect or idea about Palm Springs that you think is important to get across now so that we don't just repeat the past, but that we do look to the future, learn from the past to move into the future? Is What's your favorite building, I guess I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Some question like that. So you think I could start. I could start with that. Um, my favorite building would be the Kaufman House, which is by Richard Neutra, because it's it's gone through those type of periods that we just talked about. It was highly regarded and then it was not. And then it was basically abandoned and then it went uh, underwent a, a huge restoration effort. And now it's back on top again. It represents so much of what you see in 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 Palm Springs itself. You know, it's great. And mm -hmm. then it goes down. When I was a little girl, we'd go to Palm Springs in the early 70s, and it was not what it is today. So it's so great to see Palm Springs thriving right now. I'm happy to go next. I'm going to go outside the city limits of Palm Springs. I know, quel horror. But I'm going to go to Palm Desert because I am now, uh, just recently, for about two or three months ago, now officially a resident of Palm Desert. And that was through the purchase of one of the units at Sandpiper by Bill Kreisel, who I did my, my master's thesis on. I can honestly say that the short amount of time that I've spent here, despite the heat and the two inches of foam insulation on my roof has been 
incredibly wonderful. And it is, it's playing out all the promise of the desert lifestyle and all the intellectual rigor of Palm Springs architecture by just being here. So I feel very fortunate. I'm fortunate that all the people who came before us did see value in these places so that they can pass it along to a new generation. As long as we're going outside the city limits, Alan, <laughs> you, you should never have shown me the Doolittle House by Kellogg. It, it ruined me forever. I mean, that <laughs> is as good as it gets. And, and none of us have $5,000 a square foot to spend on building a house. It, but but it's it's the relationship. I mean that it, it, without the house, it would be an incredible, beautiful boulder pile. You know, without the houses of Palm Springs, it would still be a beautiful desert environment. But when when architecture can make a place better, maybe that's the the takeaway from the Palm Springs School. The the, the architecture actually made the place better, and it was already good but it made it better. But that do little house, oh my God. You got, have, has anybody else seen it besides Alan and myself? <laughs> it's, it's incredible. And yeah. it also, my, like my favorite building I wanted to mention is the Oasis Hotel by Lloyd Wright from 1924, yeah. because it established that use of concrete, which the do little house continues into the future. So, you know, it, it's taking those Lloyd Wright's ideas, but then taking into the future, which is what we've been talking about. Okay, we've got uh, Ken and George. Did you have an answer? To my thought, which is twofold. I love Fray One. I think that, you know, the, the house's wind-up toy is just an extraordinary creation. It's alive, it's youthful, it's bright, it's shiny. It does everything that you want a resort building to be. It's just brilliant. But the other thing that I really love, and it's all of its evil, is the checkerboard grid, which left space for the future. And in a weird way, Palm Springs doesn't know how lucky it was that it had the room to grow without pulling its belt in. We did a job up in Burlington, Vermont, and Burlington, Vermont's planners had this crazy idea that they wouldn't do all of the spaces they had available because they wanted to leave stuff for the next generation. And in a weird way, you know, Palm Springs had that opportunity and still does. I think that there's a genius to it. It can be used brutally, as William Penn did when he did the checkerboard of alternate Germans and Welsh so they wouldn't be able to take over his community. <laughs> and he sold land, you know, to different groups to keep them segregated. But in Palm Springs, the miracle was that the right people showed up at the right time solve the problem, and all of a sudden you had space, which how few cities have that? And for me, I have many of the buildings that are my favorites in Palm Springs are gone. But some that I really love that were recently designated the Araby Rock Houses that were up in the far south end, the Araby Rock Houses on the side of the mountain. I love the Bullocks Building, which we lost back in the 90s. I also love many of the buildings that are, uh, Alan mentions, that are bringing in different material technologies it's hard for me to like a particular building in Palm Springs, uh, having been in my role as preservation officer and with the city so long, seeing stuff coming through. I have a hard time picking a favorite because I love so many of them. Okay, well, we're going to wrap up now. I just have to thank you all. I knew you would all have just wonderful things to say. <laughs> I appreciate uh, your taking the time, not only to write the essay, but to do this uh, as well. And uh, as I'm getting some reaction now to people who have people outside our team who have seen the book or uh, you know have reactions to it i was hoping that it would spark you know new conversations new ideas from this conversation i i think uh, it's going to so uh, i thank you all